Bro, it's, it, to this day, bro, it blows my mind that a projectile of, of, of a, a casing or the projectile, there's two parts of the projectile, right? You got the casing and then you have the, I mean, do they, they, do they get the projectile, the, 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 the signature of it from the barrel of the gun? Because is there a signature, is there a particular individual signature on every single projectile, every single barrel that they can I, they can match from you know years apart from each other where it came out of, what barrel was shot out of? So that's a great question. Um, the first thing I'll say is that uh, I've spent a lot of time on forensic science. I use it to the benefit of my client. So let's talk about this. Is there an individual match from firearm evidence A to firearm evidence B, uh, as it relates to cartridges, a cartridge is basically what we call a bullet. It's got the projectile, it's got a casing, and it has to have the head and the gunpowder. So let's say you've got a nine millimeter, somebody discharges four times. Most firearms are called right ejectors, and they typically expel the cartridge from maybe three to eight feet. So when that evidence is recovered, uh, there's something called a tool mark examiner, firearm expert, and they'll do a comparison between sometimes a test fire and the evidence at the scene. So they use what we call comparison microscope. The problem is, is that ballistics, as it used to be called in tool marks, is not necessarily as reliable as the crime lab, the police, and the district attorney think. So I get that information from my experts. And so the answer is, if a forensic expert testifies at jury trial called by the prosecutor, what is the confidence level in the so-called match? So if you think about DNA, people say that the confidence level is there's a one in 67 trillion chance that the DNA did not come from Rosenberg's client. But the reality of firearms, ballistics, tool mark evidence is that it's nowhere near that. Tool mark examiners are people who basically work for the crime lab. And if they had to have like a real engineering or material science degree, I think the uh, profession would be enhanced. So what happens in the tool mark cases is that their expert testifies and they will say it's 100% match. And the science just does not support that. So we have fights over whether the evidence will be admissible, and if it is admissible, what's the confidence level of the identification? In other words, defendant cannot be excluded. Defendant is included. Um, it's a match, but what does, what's the strength of that match? And it's actually a huge controversial area. Um, and you know, for the lawyers out there, I wouldn't necessarily submit or take it for granted that there is a match when it comes to the firearms. Uh, most barrels are rifled, and what rifling is, is here's your barrel. It's like a spiral, and it has to do with the way the projectile flies out. Uh, they'll measure that, they'll take notes on that. Uh, a lot of people may or may not know, but in our reports, uh, a Glock barrel is typically octagonal, and that's another thing that they'll try to say is an individual characteristic. Uh, when it comes to tool marks, there's two things to think about. One is what we call class characteristics. Class characteristic is caliber, material, um, possibly gunpowder load affecting the uh, FPS feet per second. And then there's individual characteristics, and we fight about this all the time, which are how does the rifling in the barrel affect the projectile? And they test that by the crime lab, does test fires, and they compare that. So the short answer, having said that, is that it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, my boy. I love the way you broke it down. It was hell of interesting, dog. Even though I didn't get, I didn't get, you know, the depend thing kind of threw me off at the end. But uh, that man, that was. I mean, I guess that was well said. You know, it depends on how bad they want you. <laughs> yeah. So I have a case from the uh, '90s, and. Uh, forensic evidence is significant. And so what happens in this case is in the 90s, the protocols for this type of comparison was done at 10 power. So basically you have a microscope, which is what we had in you know, elementary school, high school science, and that was the basis for determining the matches. Nowadays, 
we have access to uh, electron microscopes that can go up to one in one million power. So what I'm saying is that forensic science for firearms identification tool marks is not in the uh, you know, 21st century. In my opinion, they're uh, stuck in the backwater. So for lawyers uh, who are doing these cases, they should not just accept the firearm uh, analyst conclusion that there's a match. There's a lot more to the story. So I think when somebody's hiring a lawyer, what they should look for is an attorney who doesn't make up their mind about the case during a 20 minute consultation because the facts that are supplied to you by the defendant, uh, that's certainly important, but what we're fighting is the government's case. So I would be reluctant to work with a lawyer who you call them on the phone and they say, hey, Rosenberg, I got assault with a deadly weapon for the benefit of the gang, how much? There's no way an attorney should be offering phone quotes because they know nothing about the circumstances. And it really takes a good hour before I do my intake when I know what happened, what are the circumstances, is there video from a citizen app, was this on the news? Um, so when you're picking a lawyer, you want someone who is actually going to dive in on the specific evidence and then develop their trial strategy. And I think that's why uh, people are dissatisfied with their state appointed or their appointed lawyers. Uh, that's a recurring theme when I do my new client meetings.